So we're going to be jumping to the next speaker, Sophie. Um, she, Sophie works uh, as a head of API at uh, Euler Hermes. I think it's the jewelry company. And uh, she's going to be talking about zero trust securities for APIs. Good to see you, Sophie. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks. And you? Hi, everybody. I'm good. I'm good. Better than I deserve, I guess. Uh, super in time. Let's try to share your screen very quickly to make sure everything is working correctly. I'll get out of the way and leave the stage to you. Okay. Let me know. Do you see my presentation here? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Let's uh, try to change that. Now, how, how do we do this? Yeah, so if you, you, you should see, be able to see my face and your face on the screen. And if you go down, you should be see the webcam, the microphone sign, and then the share the screen just next to the gears to the, exactly, we got it. Okay. okay. Let's jump to the thing. Perfect. I'm going to get out of the way and uh, enjoy the presentation, folks. Okay, so thank you, Vincenzo. Hi, everybody. Yeah, my name is Sophie Ruta. I'm working for Euler Hermes. We are unfortunately not the, the luxury Hermes. Uh, we are often um, um, thought of, but uh, no, we are doing credit insurance. So um, we're actually part of uh, Allianz Group, and we are a company that is very old, more than 100 years. So um, we are coming from a very traditional time where insurance looked at this, like this with like wooden desks and blocks of paper and very slow processes. And we have gone a long way to transform that. Um, so what's credit insurance? I thought to, to introduce it to, to make you understand why APIs are an uh, important thing for us. Um, so here's how the product works. Imagine there's two companies, um, left company selling goods to right company. Um, so there's a little ship going there, um, bringing the goods and an invoice. And then you have like 60 to 90 days typically to pay that invoice. And once that is paid, everybody's happy and done. Okay, fine so far. But now imagine the little ship is going there from you and uh, with coming up with the invoice. And time is starting to, to, to crawl. And well, it takes a little longer and oops. Well, unfortunately, um, yeah. I'm sorry, that's my husband just joining me in the presentation. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, but coming back to the presentation, the um, right company just got bankrupt before they could pay the invoice. And that's bad for the left company because the money will be gone. And that is actually what we insure. That's the, the credit insurance case. Um, now, as you can imagine, um, left company, now we have paid it. Left company typically has more than just one customer. Um, they can have hundreds and thousands and huge portfolios of customers. And what we will do is that we will um, cover these uh, customer relationships individually with uh, credit insurance coverage. And again, um, you need to still look at this in a more bigger picture because uh, if you look at this globally, there's of course millions of companies trading with each other, um, making millions of uh, customer relations to be insured. Um, and there's even more market players that are, are important. So there can be digital marketplaces, there can be brokers, there can be other types of, of players. And we can partner up with them to uh, secure those transactions. And essentially what you see here, these millions of transactions, uh, it's not very efficient to handle them manually or on paper like we did like 30 years ago. Um, of course, APIs are excellent to, to support that. Um, and that's why credit insurance today doesn't have those wooden desks anymore. Um, it looks like more like this. This is our developer portal that we have just um, created this year uh, to expose our APIs and hopefully get uh, masses of customers happily using it. Okay, but my talk is about uh, zero trust API security. And, and why am I talking about this? Why is it important? 
I mean, we did IT security for a while. Um, yeah. But um, IT security used to look a bit like this, um, like a fortress. Um, so you know, I look at this like these, these high walls and there's the distance between the, the company, which would be the fortress and the public. Um, maybe the, there would be water around it with crocodiles and sharks inside or whatever. It's super secure. And there's just one very secured entry also to get into that. And you can even pull up the, the entry to, to, to completely lock it away from, from everybody, which is um, a way of doing security. If you do it like that, um, and if you look at the inside of the fortress, then in the past you found probably the, the classical monolith applications and they are interacting with each other based on technical user accounts. And that's a bit like a marketplace that you find inside the fortress. Um, it's secure towards the outside world, but once you're in, you basically have access to pre pretty much everything. So if you're either an, an authorized external person or maybe you're an employee of the company, you get access to all these um, assets. And then um, as time evolved, um, there was also needs to expose data to the outside world. So we created online portals and we had to start drilling holes in that huge wall to allow that to, to give um, some access to, to the outside world, um, which worked okay. But now, of course, I imagine if we're now replacing all the monoliths by microservices, there will be plenty of them um, interacting with each other. And um, of course, the online portal then needs to have plenty of individual connections to those. And then, yeah, thinking about it, all this doesn't help you as long as you don't open it because your company is not made to, to work internally. Uh, you're, you're there to, to, to serve your customers. So you will need to drill a number of holes into your nice wall to allow that interaction. And then essentially this whole security concept is going bust. And um, yeah, that's why we opted at Euro Hermes for, for zero trust security. And what that means is actually that on each API call individually, you need to have four levels um, to, be, to, to be checked. First one is a, a very simple basic check on the, on the API gateway. It's the web application filtering, the WAF, and I like that name, WAF, WAF. Um, this is of course very simple, straightforward on the API gateway. Second level is then you need to check the ID. You need to know who is that calling your API. Um, and then you need to check the authorizations and say, okay, is he or she requesting for something that uh, she's authorized to do? And finally, you need to do some functional check to see if from a business um, perspective, what has been requested makes sense. Um, so you will do this at the microservice level typically. And I'm going to talk more about the, the internal uh, the checks, the, the ID checks and authorizations, which is more the, the complex part that we're managing currently in my team. Well, um, so I do a deep dive on the ID checks. So imagine we have those uh, various microservices that we have built. Uh, we proudly expose them on the um, on AWS in our VPC. And now we want to give them to the outside world to, to make use of them. And we thought, how should we typically do this? How should we build this? Um, the first idea was, of course, purchasing an API management that has everything in place. And then you just um, route the, the API request to that and you're secured. And I think that's something that is uh, absolutely making sense. It's very easy to, to, to implement quickly and fine. However, besides um, APIs, we also expose our business through an online portal because not all our customers want to integrate in their systems. They, they also want to use some kind of a, like an online banking that we have 
to, to manage the, the coverage. And so here you would have then an individual user and username and uh, password. And this one of course, can be accessed by our customers. And then in the background, it would um, connect to the microservices. We thought that as we are in a, in a VPC, we could, let's say, go um, in parallel of the API management to save cost on the, on the individual API calls, which is feasible. And the same you could do for the internal applications. You're in a secured environment. You can directly um, connect to those. However, we're not very satisfied because in the end, it's the same old security concept that we just uh, wanted to get rid of. So no, let's do it differently. So um, instead, we said to ourselves, okay, we have these microservices, we have them on AWS, which we chose as our cloud platform. Uh, it could have been any of the other providers, of course. Um, but having uh, this in use gives us already the, the API gateway that comes with it, which is nice. And then we said to ourselves, we are not building an online portal in parallel to all this. We're just creating screens. And uh, screens just allow using the APIs, the microservice directly. And um, having said that, we, we find that the, we, we use the same OAuth um, principles to, to have a direct API call or uh, an interaction through the customer portal. And that we can do it on the general portal that we call MyH, um, but we can also have it on our developer portal, and we do. And finally, we do the same with our internal applications. So we set ourselves, internal applications will just be screens uh, without business logic. It's all outsourced to the microservices. And the, 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 the security will just be the same as for anybody else. And um, to do this, uh, we connected our API gateway with uh, WSL2 ID server. We chose this one because we wanted it to be open source. We also wanted it to be um, easy to use and not creating license cost per user. That was a, an important thing to us because we will have a large number of users. And now, the next step is we said that we will connect this with our processes to in identify people. Because after all, we said to ourselves that the identities that work with us are natural persons, people, you and me. And uh, rather than giving just artificial technical accounts to them, we wanted to make sure that there's always a, a very good identification process. So in case of internals, of course, they go to the HR and then they are stored in the Active Directory. And we federated that with the ID server. And we did likewise for the externals where we have um, either a KYC process on the web or we meet them physically, then we know them, and then we can create their contact within Salesforce and link that to the identity on WSO2. And of course, that's not a one-way process. Um, we can also create the user, for example, on the developer portal, which is calling a microservice to create a user, and then it would launch the typical KYC process to know who that person actually is. And only once we know that, we create the identity on WSL2 and allow that person um, to start using our services. Um, Having that said, um, identity is not all. Identity always needs to be linked with a role. Um, and to, to illustrate that, if our identity uh, is an is a, um, employee of your Hermes, the, the role would be um, internal. And then we do a first filtering at the gateway level to say, OK, with that role, you are allowed to access all the microservices. Um, the role could be instead a developer, so uh, a person we don't know yet so much, but coming to our portal and uh, requesting access. Uh, in that case, we would probably just authorize 
to, to access the microservice to generate an account or an API key, um, but not the other ones. And likewise for a typical customer um, um, role on, on the MyEH portal, in this case, we would probably not allow it to generate new access, but to use all the business features that the portal provides. Um, yeah, that's, that's for the identity checks. Um, now we get to the step three, which is then authorizations. And I also um, wanted to deep dive on this because, um, yeah, we, we had a lot of uh, thoughts about how to manage these. We could have also purchased a standard application on the market to manage authorizations. Um, however, in our case, at least, we, we didn't found this to be uh, the right choice. So maybe because our model is a bit specific, um, typically, if you're a large customer of Euler Hermes, you will have multiple contracts um, to, um, to uh, manage your different regions or different purposes. So that, of course, has a business sense. Um, so we could have said authorizations is based on the contracts that you have. Very simple. But then, um, of course, a contract is not sufficient because a contract can have various features so it can be managed the, the, the coverage of your insurance or um, create reports or um, manage claims so it can be multiple different things and maybe we don't want to give all that away every time a user requests something um, well on these features, actually, we could also differentiate between read access uh, or write access, both or even admin access. And still, that is not enough because then we could have hierarchies of these contracts to be taken into consideration um, in order that we don't have to manage everything manually. So we could define these. But once this is defined, um, then of course, you will have exceptions. And with each step, of course, the whole thing is becoming more and more complex. And you need to handle that complexity because, of course, your, your authorization must be um, bulletproof. Um, and then we decided, and it's a complete workflow, to, to build it like this. So we, we have a request coming from the customer portal. At the gateway level, we would check the identity. We would find out that the role allows to, to access the microservice. Nice. Um, now the microservice will quickly check if the token is really valid because he, he may not know it. He is not connected with the, the gateway. So that's checked. And then the microservice now needs to check all those authorizations. Um, the microservice needs to understand whether this activity requested by the customer on the portal or somewhere else um, is authorized, authorized. So basically the microservice would have to crawl all that hierarchy of authorizations. And because that's complex, we decided to bundle that in an application we call the resource manager that simplifies this as a service. And in the end, the microservice would just call this um, application saying, okay, Customer one wanted to do this activity. Is she allowed to do that? And resource manager would just say yes or no. And that's all. Uh, and all the complexity is then outsourced to this resource manager application. Um, that's fine because the resource manager then handles all the performance needs and, and the complexities and everything. Um, yeah, so far for the deep dive. Now, how secure is all this? Um, of course, it's IT, so it can be attacked. It can always be attacked. But we believe it uh, largely mitigates the, the possible attacks. So we thought about what, what can people do? What can attackers do? Of course, they might steal a token. OK. But the, the impact is rather limited because the token is valid for just an hour and gives access also just to one individual user's scope. It's not the whole IT infrastructure, like if you would go into in, inside the fortress that we had earlier. Um, you could also 
succeed to steal an API key of one of our partners, of course, that would be an issue, but still it remains limited to that one partner's exact scope on, on the microservices. Um, you could also hijack a service provider, which is one of our applications, um, um, to call the APIs with that. But in the end, it doesn't help you because um, as long as you don't have a, a clear authentication um, and identity, even the service provider application can do nothing um, fine. And um, yeah, what you could maybe do is to hijack the API key that allows you to create users. That seems interesting. But then again, it doesn't help you because in addition to creating users, you would need to be allowed to create authorizations and rights for those users. And that's again, another microservice you need to hack. So you see this, this makes um, attacks from our point of view uh, much more difficult to do. And the, the impact is less. So if, if you, you can always manage an attack, okay, you might manage to attack a microservice, but you, your impact stays to that, uh, reduced to that microservice and you, you cannot access the data from the other microservices. That's very important. And the same for the online portal, you can hack it, but it doesn't give you automatic uh, access to the data behind. So some challenges, of course, um, it's not the easiest thing to do. The first challenge that we see is performance. Um, given that, all these four steps need to happen on each individual API call. The, um, the response time of your APIs must be very fast. So we're currently at 100 milliseconds. We're still tweaking it because we want to have it better than that. Um, but that's the key, key issue because otherwise you're really slowing down your entire system. The second one is um, flexibility of your role model because um, probably you don't know today which product you will have tomorrow in an ever-changing world. So you need to make sure that your authorization model is not too, too um, fixed, too, too, too stable and causing you problems then later. You really need to think about it. And then governance is a very important thing. Um, because you depend on uh, correct implementation of this by each of the microservices that you have in place. Otherwise, you will risk that um, you open an access that you don't want. And um, so we, we do a lot of automation in the deployment process, that's key. Uh, a lot of automatic non-regression tests and everything to make sure that the, the whole concept is always respected by all our microservices at a time. Um, but once you have uh, succeeded of, with these uh, challenges, um, you have a lot of benefits. Um, I mean, it was difficult once to establish this framework, but once it's up, it's very easy to connect it to a uh, microservice because you have this very simple yes or no check on the resource manager. And uh, so you just need to define new roles, profiles maybe, but then you can just connect to that existing API. That's very straightforward. And also once you have done all this, you have complete auditability of whatever's happening on your platform because every single transaction can be monitored. You always know who did it, um, what was the resources um, requested. You see everything and that's very, very good and very important. Um, and additionally, um, on the one hand, it's some work to do. On the other hand, you get the benefit that you have a cleaner data situation. So typically you avoid having redundant accounts because you do securely identify the, the, the contacts that want to, to get uh, user accounts. So you avoid the redundancy, sorry Danny. And um, then on the other hand, um, you, you force your teams to, to be rigorous in defining the roles. And, I mean, in the legacy, we had a lot of mess in the data because it was possible. Um, of course, in this framework, 
your, your authorizations, they need to be 100% clean, otherwise it won't fly. And then you have a more peace of mind, of course, that because you know that the data is clean. Yeah, and uh, last not, but not least, um, and that's maybe one of the most important points, once you succeeded that, you know that once you revoke an account, then the account is revoked. There's no application maintaining open because everybody is relying on the same security infrastructure. So a no is a no and the door will be closed. And that's it. So thank you for watching. Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, I can see there are some questions on the stage, but uh, you know we, we're not exactly in time, so I would ask you to you know to check out the chat and reach out in private. People have been asking probably three or four questions, so make sure to to check those out. But thank you very much for your presentation. I really like it.